All right. Good morning or afternoon, evening, wherever you guys are. Sorry to keep you waiting. Hey, you know, in the busy life of uh, photographers who are traveling around, we're not always like, I, I hate to break it to you guys. We don't always have our, you know what, together, but we always pretend we do. And that's part of the game of doing this stuff. But anyway, here we are. We're still getting a little bit of stuff together behind the scenes. We're not going to pull the curtain back just yet. But anyway, it's great to have you guys here. And Chicagoland is tuning in. Love to have you guys here. Um, and who else is joining us here? We've got Cornell from Romania and Amy. Hi, Amy. We talked just the other day from New York. In fact, I'm talking to a lot of you guys. It's really great. It's uh Part of our new program here i'm reaching out we're talking i'm getting to know you better and you guys may have seen an email offering you that so you might as well take advantage of it i'm not sure how long i can keep that up because my schedule's getting kind of full but listen i want to do it as long as i can a lot of really cool and exciting stuff is happening here at ayp we are building a really awesome community and platform education, mentorship, all these components are coming together. It's really fantastic. So let's just, without further ado, you guys know me, but I'm Mark Silber, and I'm an author and photographer here in Carmel, California. And before I forget, please do subscribe and hit that bell so you don't get you don't miss anything like this show. We, we want you to stay with us and to stay up to date. And I just want to let you know this show is brought to you by our friends at Bay Photo. Remember to get out and get some prints. Don't just capture your images. Make prints out of them. And uh, they're going to give you, they've got these specials like 20% off on acrylics, uh, if you want a plaque, you can still do that and you get 25% off on your first order. This is really important because I want you guys to make prints, put them on your wall, show them to the world. It's what it's all about. Well, listen, we're going to bring on our friends here in a minute. We've got, we're going to be talking about what is it exactly that makes that National Geographic look? And we're going to talk to none other than Bob Holmes, who has been with us many times. You guys have seen him and you know him. And his partner, Andrea Johnson, they're both returned from uh, a big shoot that they've been on in Washington. I know they had some challenges with smoke and we're going to probably hear about that, but we want to dive into what exactly, this is my question for them. What exactly is it that is that secret sauce that goes into being a geographic photographer? So, Andrea, are we back? We're not quite ready yet, are we? It looks like they're still working on getting the microphone set. So I think they're ready. They just oh, have to we're get ready. Unmuted okay, now. there you guys are. Make sure you're unmuted. Okay. Hello, this... you. Hello, you two. Is Can this you... working? No. It is working. Good. Perfect. And you're on screen. You're live. Move over a little bit towards Andrea because I've got you kind of split screened here. There we go. Oh, well, <laughs> which way do I go? There we go. There's a delay. There's a, de <laughs> there's a lag on our second monitor. So <laughs> yeah, don't look at YouTube. You'll get you'll you'll get it's, dizzy. How's that? That is perfect. So it's great to have you guys back with us. I know you. Bob, you told me that you had to kind of lay low because it was too smoky to shoot, right? Well, we... <laughs> God, what a year. All it's sorts of stuff going on. Problematic on every level. Uh, smoke, COVID, everything. Yes. You know, it's, uh, it's been very, very difficult. And we came back, as we talked before, we just got out of Argentina in time uh, by the skin of our teeth. Yes flights out of the country and since then it's uh, we haven't been doing a lot really we've had four assignments in Spain cancelled one in Portugal uh, 
So in a way, it's been a disastrous year, but um, this is harvest time and we've been unbelievably busy because most of the work is outside. There's inevitable social distancing. And, um, you know, we've been working right up to yesterday, which is why we had to cancel our uh, our appointment last week to do this. Yeah. We just swamped with work. Anyway, um but we're it. here and we're going to we're going to dig into your guys work process and and just answer this question of so what what are that what's that secret sauce that goes into the geographic look? I think maybe the best way is to bring up your photos and we can talk about it while we're going through them. Yeah, well, I think I, I think the first thing is that there are no secrets. Yeah. Uh, geographic stories are about storytelling. They're stories. They're not single standalone photographs. Um, they're stories, and it's all about content. You have to have strong content because you have to tell that story. It's the ultimate documentary photography. Yes. Um, so really, that's all there is to it. Everything else that comes into a geographic shoot is things I talk about all the time, like uh, awareness of light, looking for details and gesture, being aware of the edges of the frame is basic photography. But over and above everything, it's all about content. If there's, not, if there's no content, it's not going to work. So, so true. That's basically it. Um, so uh, do you want to start with... Yeah, uh, we have that first image. Uh, yeah, boy, it's leave. definitely a COVID harvest, isn't it? Everybody's wearing masks and they're well, pouring into... That's part of the story, Mark. It you know, is. This, in the, I haven't worked for Geographic for a long, long time. Uh, and in those days, we used to have the luxury of time to do a shoot. Right. You know, the first shoot I did was four months. Um, now you're lucky to get four hours. Isn't that crazy? It's changed absolutely dramatically. Not, yeah. Which has, it's changed with Geographic as well. Not to the same extent as other magazines. Well, you're lucky to find a magazine that's still accepting assignment work. True that, boy. These magazines are using stock photographs because there's so much cheap and free stock around that it doesn't make any sense to assign a photographer um, at, at great expense to do what they can fill with stock. The quality is not as good, inevitably. It's not as focused. And Andre will probably be talking about that. Andre's been doing some magazine assignment work recently. Um, but our, the, the work that we've been doing in Oregon and Washington has been for specific clients. This this series that I'm going to show, I'm just going to show one series of photographs. Yeah. One client over one morning. Okay. As opposed to a four-month shoot, this was a four-hour shoot. And this uh, is in Washington, right? This is in Oregon. Oregon, in the, okay. In Willamette Valley, or central Willamette Valley, in an area called the Eola Hills. Um, and it's for a client whose vineyard is called Open Claim Vineyards. And it was important to get OCV that you see on the side of the bins. You know, that's a little detail uh -huh. that I was always conscious of because the client will use these websites a lot of social media uses um beyond that i wanted to show the grapes actually going into the bin the yep. time was critical uh, i wanted good placement of the people you can see them wearing face masks yes. to show that they were being careful over covid it's a very timely photograph for it really it is early morning and it was foggy uh and eventually you know, the sun starts to come up. If you can just keep going fairly quickly, Jared, go on to the next one. You yeah. see the sun, the, the sunrise hitting the trees in the background. Yeah. I, I love the stacking of these bins with OCV on each one. Right. And I waited until someone was, someone was coming out of the vines with buckets full of grapes and someone dumping a bucket full of grapes in one of the bins. And the, I like the composition as well. I That's saw, your decisive moment, isn't it, Bob? Because you, you really did get, just at that moment, both of those people in the right position. Yeah, and that's important. You have to look for that. Yeah. It's not haphazard. You look for it. 
Um, and it has a lot of content, but it's also got good form as well. Yes. So it, it can, and I think that's one of the secrets of a geographic photograph. A lot of the photographs have lots of content, but they're also a decent standalone photographs. Right. This I just loved all the buckets. Yes. The almost abstract effect of the buckets between the vines. And it says a lot about harvest and the the ant-like activity of harvest workers in the vineyard. And I also love backlight. Yeah. It's my favorite kind of light. But again, positioning was careful. I like the guy in the, the far left with his leg bent in the other shot. This far left corner. You know, just that mo little bit of movement. Let me see that. I'm not quite... I think I'm covering you. I'm going to move this screen here. There we go. The far left corner. Far left. Oh, yes. He has his oh, leg right. up. There it is. Got one leg. So it looks yeah. as though there's some movement. If he'd got his legs both down, it would be almost too static. So right. I'm always trying to get that. And the guys above him with their sort of legs walking, they're very little details, but they're important. You know, they, right. they suggest movement and activity. And you have the, you know, the leading lines of the vines, you know, the space in between them, which kind of highlights those guys. Yeah, well, what I really love doing is using wide lenses. And with COVID, that's difficult because it means getting in close. True. Uh, but, yeah, by using this anchor of a, a tub full of Pinot Noir grapes and the pickers in the background, it sort of, uh, it, it adds to the feeling of, actually being in the village. This this wasn't set up. You know, they, they usually collect two buckets full before they take them back to the bins. Uh-huh. They're paid by the bucket. I know. And, you know, and you see the two people picking here. And by getting down low, I not only emphasize the grapes, but I'm able to look under the vines and see the people picking. So you crouch down pretty low, right? Well, fortunately... I, I'm using the new Nikon mirrorless cameras. Aha. Uh -huh. And they have a hinge screen. Yes. So I can hold it down. You just held and it I down. See what I'm shooting. That's I'm a handy, up. that's a very handy uh, feature because, yeah, you don't have to crawl down on the ground. Oh, you're not kidding. It, yes. Yeah. And also for holding it above my head. You know, it works True. on both levels. Yeah, it's great for that. This is what we used to do with roll of, uh, roll of flax or. Well, and this is another shot from a low angle. And I, was, I wanted her face. I wanted the mask for COVID. I wanted to see the grapes. And I wanted to see her actually clipping, holding a bunch of grapes and clipping it. Right. So we got down low behind the vines and shot through. And the what color. Do you, what? I, also look for, I also look for color. Color is important. Some of the pickers were wearing very drab clothes. So I was looking for, for people that were wearing colorful clothes. So they contrasted with the uh, the leaves that were turning. What do you think the focal length on that was, Bob? Probably about 20 millimeter. Okay, so that's pretty wide. It's pretty wide, yeah. Yeah. But perfectly framed in between the leaves. That was That was a great shot. Aha. Uh -huh. And another shot without a face. Yeah. <clears throat> Maybe he wasn't wearing a mask, I don't remember. But I like I like abstracting people sometimes. I love sun flares, as you know. Yes. So I stopped down to F twenty two and got this sunburst coming through the grape leaves. And his hands actually clipping a bunch of grapes to go into his bucket. Let's talk about this for a second, because I know we you you brought it up in one of the previous shows that you often will uh, take the person's face out or head out or whatever. And, you know, I think that that maybe breaks a sort of a common misconception that you should only have, you know, the full person in or whatever. T tell us your philosophy about that. So he's getting a model release. Yeah, there you go. That's that's one way of... That's all there is to it, Mark. <laughs> that's the bottom line. No model release. No, I, because Could I'm be often, anybody. I'm often not taking photographs about personalities. I'm yeah. taking photographs about uh, a, a moment in time that's part of a bigger 
you know, part of a bigger picture. So it's not about a person. Yeah. It's about what they're doing. And by cutting the face out, it can emphasize that. If you look at my, anybody who wants to look at my recent Instagram feeds, uh, there's a whole series of photographs of people in silhouettes and without their faces being visible, recognizable. I didn't really realize it until I was looking at it the other day and realized that the last several posts I've done have all been of silhouettes and faceless people, and they work. It's a technique I use a lot, as you know. Yeah, and it's something that, you know, I think we don't often see, but it definitely works. In this case, you know, we see the guy behind there, we see the sun flare. There's, you know, you know that there's somebody there, but it does leave you asking questions, which I know is another thing you like to do with your photographs. I, I always want to leave questions to be asked. And I, in this shot, I also wanted to show the grapes. The fruit is obviously the major thing about harvest. Without the fruit, there wouldn't be any thing to pick. So I wanted to show the, the clusters of Pinot hanging. And I also made, I wanted to make sure they were good looking clusters. I didn't want clusters where there'd been a lot of rot. Right. Sometimes you get a, a lot of rotting grapes. Which... Bob, I'm, gonna, I'm sorry, I'm going to bring up your Instagram quickly to show what you were talking about. A lot of silhouettes, as you said, yeah, and, think... and faceless, mostly. For the most part, we're not seeing any faces here. Yeah. I don't necessarily cut the heads off. But I use them as silhouettes. I'm glad to hear you're not cutting anybody's heads off. But you're right. Every every one of this in this whole series, the guy with the cape, the the uh, I don't know what they are. Are they, are they a group of fishermen? They have some sort of bags that they're holding. I don't know what you're looking at. No. It's uh, it's so you have a very so you have the guy with the cape, and the next to it is a very bright orange. Oh, then then they. they it's in Kathmandu, and there's a rainstorm. Uh -huh. and I came out of a, 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 a stupa called Swamba, I think it is. And right in front of me was this group of men in a heavy rainstorm with plastic bags over their heads. Oh, that's what that is. Okay. So Interesting. Quick, those are plastic them. bags. Wow. Yeah, they're just plastic bags. Anyway, well, that's definitely yeah illustrating the point you're making about silhouettes and other things that, you know, it also keeps you looking at the form, as you said, rather than the person. Yeah. Uh, you um, know, I use that a, a lot. It's, uh, yeah. Anyway, can we move on to the next yes, one? Yes, please. Jared, there we go. Wake up, Jared. Yeah, there he is. We we got him. We got him back. And, and, and I'm always thinking when I'm shooting. I'm always thinking in a logical progression. You know, I, I'm shoot. I think as I would think if I was shooting a story for a magazine. You know, I, I show overall shots. I show tight shots of the grapes being picked. Then I show the grapes being carried back to the bins. And again, I want action. Uh, this shot with the legs. The guy is obviously walking, carrying yeah. two heavy bu buckets. You can see the grapes in the buckets by getting fairly high. I think I was probably holding the camera over my head for this. Uh -huh. uh, yes, see, I see that now. Layers are very important. I want something in the foreground and something in the background. I want to give depth to the shots, like yeah. the, bu the bucket of Pinot grapes and the pickers in the far distance. Now, I'm trying to show layers. And of course, they've got face masks. That's right. Some, some of the people were not wearing, wearing face masks. And a lot of them are not wearing them correctly. They had them under their noses. So I was very conscious of making mm -hmm. sure that these were correct. Good point. Bob, I want to take a minute here. I'm going to talk about the fact that not everybody knows that we created a course that goes into detail you're hearing you're hearing bob's points but we took two days we followed him around with a camera several cameras actually in a, a couple of wineries in napa 
and we recorded everything he was doing. And I follow, I, every time I saw him doing something that I wasn't really sure why he was doing it, or I thought maybe people on the, you know, viewing it weren't sure, I asked him a question, which annoyed the heck out of Bob. But he's very patient. I and wasn't, I wasn't either. At the end of the day, he was just re so glad to have me off <laughs> from asking these annoying questions. But uh, kidding aside, we really broke down his process into these parts over a two-day period. Now, we have this priced here at $397, but we're actually going to give you guys a $200 discount. $200 discount. I'm not kidding. Uh, Jared will put the link in there. $97. Bucks, but you should really take this course because you're hearing bits and pieces. I think you pieces. mean 300 <laughs> What's that? Three hundred dollar discount. I, I, it's even okay. Who authorized that? Three hundred dollar discount. Okay. Well, we're down to ninety seven bucks, which is pretty much giving it to you guys. But the point is, you're going to see the entire workflow that Bob goes through, including how he finds inspiration, what he does with his gear, how he approaches a shoot how he deals with problems on a shoot, because when, when we were shooting this, there were fires, the power went down, you know, all these crazy things that happen, you're gonna see all that stuff. And there's another whole layer to this thing is we have unedited versions of all the interviews I've ever done with Bob, which is great because you get to see the real Bob Holmes, the unedited version. So I'd love you guys to take advantage of it. There's the code. Put the link in there. I think it's already in there. I couldn't couldn't resist that, Bob. So back to the regularly scheduled program. Here we are with some more grapes going into yeah, these this bins. The sequence, yeah, the buckets come back. The grapes are dumped into the bin. As I say, I love backlit shots. Um, I like shooting early in the day and late in the day. The sun was just coming over the trees. If you go on to the next one, uh, Jared, that's... Oh, look at that. that they're, they're almost identical, but the light comes better through the grapes. Yes, that's incredible. I rarely, I rarely shoot a single shot of anything. Um, I don't use fast, you know, whatever you call it, multiple drive, motor drive, yeah. whatever. I'm Space always... Burst. I want, I want to release the shutter when I think it should be released. Uh -huh. That was one of my big problems with the first mirrorless cameras. I used a Sony, one of the early Sonys, and it used to drive me crazy because it was a shutter like. It was milliseconds, but I'd miss the shot. Uh. With, the, uh, with the Z series, I find it's much more responsive. Um, so I, I did the previous shot and then immediately shot another one when the light came better through the grapes. And again, I'm using this motif of the sun, early morning sun and the sun star coming through. You want me to put them up together? I could do that. Yeah, you can do that. Yeah, that'd be great. But it's, a, it's a very subtle difference, but... And oh, I also yes. noticed there's no, uh, there's a vehicle here in the first one and then it's gone in the other one. That's yeah. right. But you're right, Bob. The sun coming through the grapes that really makes it pop, and that yeah, adds a it whole makes all point. the difference to me. Yeah, there's little details. See, everyone is in the same position, uh, but it's those little details that make the, make the better shot. And yeah. you have to be aware of that. You have to be absolutely anal about details in photographs. Don't be satisfied with the first shot you get, because often you can get better. I've been making that point. We've been doing critiques every week, Bob. And one of the points I've made is you have to also be patient. That that perfect image may not just immediately pop out, right? You have to hang out there long enough to, to get enough to where you know you've really captured the one that makes a difference. Like in this case, yeah. the sun. I mean, that's all, it makes all the difference. Yeah. And I find it very, very difficult photographing with anyone else because I hang around a lot. Yeah. You know, I, I, I'm very conscious of just hanging out and not doing anything. You know, one of the most irritating things as a travel photographer was being at a great destination, waiting for everything to come into place 
for the shot and someone coming up to you <laughs> and asking you to take their photograph. Oh, no. And you feel such a jerk when you say, I'm sorry, I'm working. You know, and I, occasionally I take the photograph and I miss the shot. And you're I'm, standing there and you, you lose like, the shot. And I've missed it because I'm taking some dumb tourist photograph. And it's, you know, people don't realize how intently you have to look. That's so true. Well, you know from your time with Ansel Adams, I mean, he was famous for waiting nine hours for the clouds to line up just the way he wanted. I don't remember which which one that was, but I don't have that patience. But that's a long time. But waiting I'll wait, I'll, is I'll wait part out. of this. But I go back to places as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's if another. I see something that I think is going to work, then I'll go back later. And Andre uses Andre uses a, a sun position program, which you'll probably tell you about. I'll talk about that it for sure. Enables you to anticipate where the sun is going to be at a certain time of day so yeah. you can go the next day at just the right time and know exactly what the conditions will be just called sun seeker sun seeker bob getting back to this original point about national geographic i mean that would be part of your how you approach an assignment right you are in that scene for long enough to where you're going to you're going to get a variety of different images and different times but oftentimes the same subjects, right? Or similar, if you're going to a certain location, for instance. Well, it depends on the story. It depends on the story. Everything's different. Yeah. But you're certainly there long enough to, as we've been talking about, you know, find those moments. Yeah, the, the, the problem I always had with the geographic, I did a shoot in Bermuda once with um, the editor. Yeah. The, the, one of the editors, he was the editor of Geographic, Bill Garrett. Bill Garrett was one of the great editors. And we were in Bermuda together, and he was complaining the whole time that we were only there for two weeks. Isn't that, that amazing? It, it was unrealistic to take meaningful photographs in two weeks. My approach has always been to start shooting as soon as the plane lands. Right. right out there, hitting the street and shooting. Because my philosophy is that things are fresh when you first arrive and you're seeing things that after a couple of weeks you will miss because they become commonplace. So true. I, I, ideally, it's a mixture of the both. You know, it's an amalgam of both first impressions and in-depth shooting. But the geographic model has always been to spend a lot of time before you pick up a camera even. And I've always worked in completely the opposite way. I remember we talked about this exact point when we shot your course, Bob. I mean, we had a longer discussion about it, but that was that was a key point of how much time do you need in a in a location to really get what well, you need out the of it? The reality is, whenever I go back to a place, I make increasingly better photographs. So Good there's point. Only, even in the, the most, if I went back to this harvest again, I'd make different photographs and probably some better. This is a little bit narrow because it's one vineyard and yeah. a fair small space. It's either side of one vineyard. It's a tiny area. Yeah. Uh, but you always, you see more things. You know, this is a shot I particularly like because of gesture. It's all about, it shows, it Amazing. shows what's happening. It shows the bins being filled. Um, I like the position of the worker in the back. Yeah. With her arms out. And the tractor taking a bin off back to the winery for processing the fruit. And the sunburst, of course. So well orchestrated. And I love the orange of the tractor, you know, it's just yeah. contrasted. The OCV on three of the bins. There it is. Immediately labels it as um, open claim vineyards. Yeah. Of course, the client loves it because that's what they're selling. Perfectly orchestrated. That's awesome. Ah, and then the drone. The that a lot of us have in our arsenal now is a drone. Yeah. Drones are so inexpensive and light and easy to carry. So, you know, when I'd done most of the drone shooting, I threw a drone up in the air. And again, I love long shadows. Uh, I, I took this. I like the shadows uh, and what's happening. But then I shot it. 
like this, uh -huh. which is more dynamic. As soon as the vines are on a diagonal plane, it makes it more lively. The first one was static. This is much more a much more dynamic shot. Yes, two tractors in this, so it's the same principle. And then I go higher, and let's see that next stop. one, Jaron. There, oops. Okay. Same principle, but at an angle, it's more a more straightforward shot. And then go higher still and shoot uh -huh. all vineyards. Such a great tool to have a, a drone and using it for stills, especially. Is I love shots like this as well. It's just amazing. that little punctuate, the punctuation, which is another thing I talk about a lot. The yes. punctuation of the tractor with the bin of grapes going across. And then I think probably the last shot of mine is a shot showing, and this is more of a geographic type of shot because yeah. it shows the landscape. The previous shot showed the vineyards, but it gave you no idea of the landscape around the vineyards. This last shot, I went higher and showed the countryside of uh, central Oregon around the vineyards. Fantastic. And again, with the punctuation of the tractor. Yeah. Without Without, Without that, it would be kind of a nothing photograph, wouldn't it? Without that, well, I mean, it really. A lot of people would take, but to me, it needs it needs that it, punctuation. Totally. And again, it's it's small. It doesn't matter how big it is, but they have to have the punctuation there. Such a key point. Okay, so I think. Well, wonderful. That's, that's wonderful, that's though. What I have to say about it that was you know that was a four hour shoot, and I got enough in that. For a magazine spread, if they want to do a, a story on harvest, there'll be enough photographs there to illustrate it. That's right. There's 17 shots. And those wow. are edited, of course. There's 17 out of about 300. Yeah. That took a lot of garbage. Well, listen. And you have to accept that. Uh, yes, exactly. We all take that photo. Every frame isn't going to be perfect, but you pulled out 17 out of 300, which is not a bad ratio. Let's face it. And you didn't shoot. The other thing, Bob, is you didn't shoot 3,000 that you now have to go back and sift at, through those 3,000 to find the 17. That's a lot of work. Yeah, I wouldn't have the patience for that, Mark. Yeah, I, can edit, I don't either. I can edit pretty quickly. Well, thank you, Bob. And once again, you guys, listen, if you want the full-on course that he goes through and you see him at work, we're giving it away practically. I didn't know we knocked off 300. I must have been not not in my right mind. But anyway, you're going to get it for 97 bucks. Take advantage of it. Don't do it now because we want you to see the rest of the show. Okay, Andrea, let's look at some of your photos. Jared, you got them. There we go. Wow, look at that. Well, this is different scenes in Oregon um, starting the summer. Um, it has been a crazy vintage obviously to try to capture things it's my 17th harvest photographing here wow. and um in preparation trying to find the right vineyard locations and the app that i was talking about knowing where the sun's going to come up and having it ready i was actually doing a drone shoot at this time uh -huh. Maybe I had the camera on a tripod and i was able to kind of navigate both simultaneously um, often Bob and I will divide and conquer when we have a larger photo shoot and work multiple angles in different spots, but I was on my own this time. And you really want to be able to capture a sense of place, which Mount Hood in the background does only in the summer when the sun is really low. Um, in the winter, if there was more snow and it pops a little bit better. Uh -huh. um, the only thing that was missing for this scene is not really having people or context into it. And that's what I normally rely on is harvest begins at dawn, which isn't as early as the summer. Usually at seven o'clock or so in Oregon and Washington. Um, and there's usually a lot of activity going on with great light. But this year was a tricky one with the California fires bringing a lot of smoke up to Oregon. And yeah. Um, circumstances and so everything was kind of in flux until last minute picking decisions were made so you have to just kind of learn to to fly with options and 
the next couple are outtakes from a magazine story I was doing with Wine Enthusiast. So the, the Wine Enthusiast story was a series of profiles on new winemakers or new techniques they're working on, but it was all directed to be not portraits per se, but the people in the environment and different um, activities they're doing in preparation. So yeah, the second one was shot like at high noon, which is the exact opposite that I would typically want to be doing landscape options. Yeah. And I had to also figure out how to get around not having the person wear a mask. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so they're there on their own. Um, but winemakers will go through the vineyards and do their samples of the grapes. So you can see the Chardonnay in the plastic bag. Oh, I and see that. Okay. Walking through the vineyard to taste for ripeness. And then from there is when they choose the actual pick time. So this is um, a sommelier that's a winemaker that's really well known in Washington. And I'm not going to be able to show what's in the magazine because it hasn't published yet. But every other shot of him was with a suit and a tie or like in some fancy restaurant environment. I really wanted to capture how involved he is in the vineyard and the right. fresh and a little bit of the sense of place. So like Bob, I was, um, I think I was crouched fairly low, could have held the camera down um, with a bit of a wider angle and just had him walk past me as he was um, doing that process. And you can, I don't like an overly HDR photo, but there's a lot of dynamic range and camera raw files now. So it's all, all natural. Right. I didn't pop anything into his face and just figured out an angle where the, the sunlight wasn't too jarring. Wonderful. I love the diagonal lines again on the, and, and, you know, in the behind him. The lines of the vineyards and that adds so much interest yeah, in vit and vitality. The Gorge is really unique. I think during the story, I only had oh, maybe six hours in a week of the light <laughs> that we had just um, rainfall that we really needed greatly and a lot of fog. So you've got to just work and move really quickly with the scenarios. So the, the next one is continuing on in Washington to a winery that Bob and I do a lot of work with. It's Cayuse. And this is their, their vineyard up towards the Blue Mountains. It's very steep. The drone shot kind of flattens it out a bit those mm. angles are up to 60 degrees, which makes it really hard to be able to showcase the terroir and keep up with the, the pickers. Right. But, you know, another way to kind of showcase a group shot safely done is to get people to spread out and bring a drone in there. So just trying to add a little bit of playfulness to... Oh, I see. They're raising their hands. Yeah. Yeah. And then another one of their vineyards is more flat and it's like the opposite. So it's difficult to try to see what they're doing in there. So by bringing a drone straight over and again, the diagonals and just waiting for the right moment with the grapes to be handed over into the, the tractor, you get a sense of um, just how narrow those lines are, which is um, really unique. And there's Bob doing video. I just realized in the bottom section right below. Is he in there? Yeah, oh, yeah, I see the back of his head, the hat. There you yeah. are, Bob. With the white hat. Yeah, that's you, isn't it? No, isn't that you with the blue hat? That's me, yeah. The, the blue hat, hat. yeah. The bl blue yeah. hat. You're up there. Okay, you're right in close shooting video. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So not only having to... A cameo. ...something but keep Bob not recognizable. <laughs> A cameo appearance. So speaking of cameo, yeah, the mask. Um, yeah. When you're working really hot, steep, this crew is amazing um, how they're able to pick in these conditions over and over. It's, you're like a mountain goat. It's all this fractured basalt and these really steep vines and this amazing um, terroir that um, I wanted to be able to capture. So I was on the top of the row shooting down and you can see a little cow in the background. They have a pasture. Uh, it was midday light, um, which isn't as ideal again, but um, all the lines converging, I think, made it work. And it's more the Definitely. series of photos that um, the next two, in conjunction with this, I think, give a sense of this place. Oh, yeah. So, and carrying that, I mean, those are, you know, actually the normal bucket's 25 pounds. I'm sure that's like 35 pounds or so, and, and they move fairly quick. So you've uh, got to anticipate where they're going to come into the frame. And, um, yeah, just 
keeping it vintage specific with the, the face masks and the safety being spaced apart, but not having it be like forbearing. So the same thing, there's the winemaker, Christophe, he's sampling some of the grapes um, as they're being sorted into the bins and yeah. just how steep it is kind of looking behind the scene. So. Wonderful. And then this is back in the Willamette Valley, and it was a magical foggy morning, but from the ground until you got to maybe 700 feet, there was a really dense layer of fog. So you can see all the white layers in the shot and kind of the remnants of the California fire. This oh, yeah. The last fire actually started to creep back up into Oregon. So there weren't the typical crystal clear shot. So I had to go pretty high as 400 feet above the vineyard. And then I actually did an, a unique thing with the drone is I did five different photos and I stitched them in Photoshop after. Oh, that wow. Cool. Because obviously you don't have the drone like most uh -huh. drones don't go you know, on their side, you're in trouble. So I wanted to be able to capture that layering of the sky, smoke, yeah. and the flow. And then this vineyard is almost at a thousand feet, so it popped up above, and um, you just got the tiny harvest crew and cars beneath. Um, and I had a whole series of these photos, but I just thought this was interesting how you can still take a drone and when you've got not as ideal skies, when you're down at a lower level, figure out different ways to to be able to shoot it. That's amazing. Um, yeah, and then. I, I have a few photos from previous harvests in here. Bob and I, we both do a lot of work for Salud. And so much of the harvest energy is the concentration and the energy and the focus that these people are working and picking. It's incredibly hard work. Um, and so much of that often is in the faces. And so it was interesting this year to try to do a different dynamic with that when we had to shoot everything with masks on. So I guess it's just a little teaser to previous harvests, the, the next previous time. years. Um, this I love. If you look at the dogs, yeah, it's, uh, it's a is that a pug? Yeah, but you know how their mouth kind of goes down, and you look uh -huh. at her mouth, and I love the little. Oh, tiny that's tiny. true. They're both doing the and same the dog expression. Winemaker throughout the whole vineyard. Every time she picked, um, they um. often love to sample some of the grapes but i just i like that moment how the sun really brought the attention to what she was picking and their expressions um kind of the mirroring. dog looking at yeah that's you know, great so, and then again usually we have beautiful light and weather so it really captures that feeling of, of harvest early in the morning as people are out on location so all these are not set up shots so I'm just following the crew and figuring out the right angle and perspective and composition to be at to give a feeling of what that vintage is. Right. And that's actually skipping back to a different day at Open Claim. Um, and it was super foggy that morning. And so I, I, for me, this kind of encapsulated a bit of the feel of this vintage, a little bit more mysterious. We've had great fall conditions waiting past all the fires and so the grapes look great people both had masks on but they're kind of out of focus in the background because i wanted to be able to capture more the mood of the scene instead of the actual pickers fantastic and then this yeah just a spider had web so different options that had a very mysterious type of feel we actually did um, a bunch of videos with this as well, but I the thick fog and how it just perfectly affixed to the spider web and the feeling of of harvest. He had a mask on, but he's walking away from camera, so you can't tell, and it's not really the focus of it. But I thought it also captured the mood of the the vintage, and it's another way to get around when you don't have any light. It was thick as piece of soup fog that morning. Wow. And it captured something that's different for that vintage. And every year is really different. And then coming into the little details as well. So most of the vineyards we work with are organic or biodynamic or regenerative agriculture, just focusing on the health of all the microsystems and organisms that are there. So ladybugs are beautiful and they're a sign of good luck, but they're also a sign of a really healthy environment. 
So just kind of coming in on some of the details when maybe the larger landscapes aren't as easy. Yeah. I love the way you're, you're capturing from the very huge perspective of the drone shots all the way down to, you know, this tiny element, which is great because we get these different perspectives, which is really important in a, in a, in a photo essay, right? Because you want to be able to have a lot of choices and tell, tell different parts of the story with, with uh, different perspectives. Yeah, and I think you have to be really true to what the environment gives you and then react. So this vintage has been more transitional weather than typical. So it's kind of directed the style of photographs to take, whether I'm trying to capture a mood or optimize the light or something so that you can look at the series from this year and have a different feeling of what vintage 2020 is versus past years. Right. So again, having photographed this for 17 years, you want to be able to stay fresh and keep creative and do something that um, is different than maybe the same vineyard you photographed for the last five or 10 years. And um, keeping it real is one aspect that you can do through just different choices of lens and composition and focus. Right. Awesome. Okay. I think uh, we've got one question that I think would be, I'd, I'd like to know the answer to before we wrap up. Um, we've got Jared, uh, Chicagoland Jared. He's curious if either of you miss film when it comes to the dynamic range when shooting into the sun. Uh, he says digital doesn't seem to have quite gotten there. It still blows out uh, oftentimes. And he also wanted to know if you use your histogram much. Uh, I, I loved shooting with Kodachrome. You know, it's because of the dense... I like a lot of blacks in photographs, and I love the, the D-Max you used to get with Kodachrome. Um, and certainly, digital photographs are always obvious when you shoot into the sun. Yeah. You can recognize a shot that's been made digitally immediately. Yeah. Uh, but I don't think I would trade the ability for the greater dynamic range of digital with film. I, you know, I, I shot film for thir over 30 years I shot film. And I find it hard to believe now that I had the nerve to go halfway around the world shooting film and not having a clue what I'd got. Isn't that amazing? I just, I just don't know how I did it. It would scare me stiff now. Yeah, it's absolutely amazing how things have changed. Yeah. So, you know, the ability to get instant feedback and know if you've captured the shot is uh, worth everything I've lost from the, the quality of film, although I still love film. And the other problem, of course, is, well, it's, it's a mix. One of the big problems with digital is storage. Yeah. Uh, it's a huge problem. You know, we've got terabytes of storage. And we see them behind you. Particularly with video, it's a nightmare, an yeah. absolute nightmare that I've been through in the last 24 hours looking for footage. And with my lack of organizational ability, it's... Uh, it is not fun. And with film, you could always go back to the film and find it. The, the problem is it takes up a hell of a lot of space. Well, you had to be in your office, too. You know, and we, with everything uploaded. Yeah, we, we can be remote. In, uh, in, in your course, Bob, we actually did a shoot in your uh, garage with, does, it seems like dozens of filing cabinets full of, this Transparencies, is a cabinet, so unbelievable! Yeah. You'll get you guys actually get to see what it's like to store yeah. this stuff. It's pretty oh, amazing. Yeah, it was, it, I, I still like the ability to store film like that, because it, as long as you're methodical about returning the slides to the right file, you could find them in in seconds almost. That's, that's um, right. And for years, I had I had an office that's all stock. And we used to send sometimes 10 FedEx packages out a day. And I had a couple of people working with me who would be filling these orders. And we, we had these banks of file cabinets and were able to find things pretty Amazing. quickly. Um, what was I'll, I'll jump in, too, with a little bit of the dynamic range question. I mean, I'm sure most people on this 
I might be speaking a little bit basic, um, but when you look at an, like an iPhone sensor, even like the iPhone 11 versus the first, versus a lot of the, the newer cameras, even the Nikons, the mirrorless, when you get to the ones with the larger megapixels, they have an amazing amount of dynamic range in it. Yeah. Whereas the ones with the smaller sensor, you really can't capture that and the highlights blow out quite a bit. So we usually do have the histogram option on and double check it, but it's knowing that the part of the photograph is the most important for the detail. So I mean, I'm looking at this um, ladybug right now and someone mentioned something about the reflection, which I do think is kind of cool, probably blew out a little bit, yeah. but I was more intent on capturing the detail and the shadow and the grapes. So I think it's just thinking about knowing what you can pull out in camera raw and being able to to try to shoot for that and especially when something's moving and you don't want to lose that moment that you've got that histogram there to quickly reference and then go from there yeah i think it's important that everyone should shoot in raw i think yeah. it's just full hard. i know wedding photographers that shoot jpegs doesn't it make any sense full hardy absolutely full hardy you can always rescue a raw photograph to some extent and i always have the histogram on and check the histogram fairly frequently but shooting in raw and making sure your histogram and you've got to learn how to read a histogram you know, so you don't cut off i certainly don't want to cut off the high the far right which right. are right i don't mind cutting off the shadows because i like shadows with no detail in fact one of my favorite shots that i took in peru a year or two ago was of a silhouette a, a, one of my classic shots, I guess, of a silhouette of a woman in a market. And I had it printed for an exhibit by a really good printer. And he spent ages trying to bring the detail out in this woman. And when I saw the final print, you could see the woman's, you could see detail. And I didn't want that. I wanted it to be silhouette. Right. I wanted it to be black. And he totally destroyed the image. And it wasn't a bad photograph, but it wasn't what I wanted to say. Uh, so you know, the, you've got to be, you've got to know what you want. But the histogram helps you do that. Absolutely, it's an amazing tool that you know. When you look back at all we had before was a light meter, and now we have this histogram, which is essentially a, um, a light meter on steroids, telling you exactly what's going on. Yeah. Well, listen, you guys, thank you so much for sharing your work once again and your wisdom. It's always a pleasure to have you with us. Thanks and any Thanks. final thoughts before we sign off? Any any point that you'd like to leave our viewers with that they ought to be taking care of and paying attention to? Well, I think people should get out and shoot. You know, I have a lot of friends, of old workshop students that call me and say they've they just haven't been able to go out and photograph. They're not in the mood to photograph. But you, I think the answer is to give yourself an assignment. Yeah. Give you self-assign something. A magazine story. Think. Imagine you're shooting for a magazine, and go out and shoot that story. Obviously, it can't involve people if you're shooting people close up. Uh, but you can find subjects. You know. If, if there's a local garden that's open, you could do a story on that garden. You know, there's a, an area called, I think it's the Rose Garden in Portland. That's beautiful. You could go and do something on that. Uh, you know, I, I shot for a lot of local magazines like Sunset Magazine, the AAA magazines, and they're always local focused stories. And you could even go through old magazines and see what other people have done and go out and do your own ver variation of that. There's so much to photograph, but just get off your backsides and get out there and do it. Or to use family or friends or an yeah. opportunity to be outside to enjoy it and or even do just... the example of having to shoot people with masks on and figure out creative ways to show that a little bit, to show it not at all, to That's show right. it as an accent point, to make it look friendly or not friendly. There's just like so many different fun spiffs. And when we look back on 2020, we're all gonna remember this stage in time and it might not be, you just made the stand up desk go down. <laughs> <laughs> he's just adding a little interest to the, he's driving the desk. 
<laughs> Absolutely so great point. Go through living this experience, but I think it's impossible, like if we think about our own journaling experience, to have the memories of how we and people we cared about experienced that. So That's right. by default, that type of assignment gives you focus and it'll be interesting to look or, back or on. Or just shoot. Just shoot. If you look at some of the Instagram feeds of people like um, oh, David Allen Harvey, you know, Dave Harvey has a strong Instagram feed and it's just often a lot of photographs of the East Coast. Um, very ordinary photographs very often, but he's out there every day shooting. Um, another friend of mine uh, who posts regularly, they're just fairly low-key domestic photographs. Doug Manway, who's a very high-profile photographer, uh, if you look at his Instagram feed, a lot of very ordinary photographs, but he's out there all the time shooting. And it's important to do that. You mean that ordinary subjects, not Ordinary subjects. Even the photographs can be ordinary. You don't have to take photographs that blow your socks off every time. You know, it's just important to keep shooting. They're good photographs, technically good, compositionally good, but they don't necessarily have the pizzazz that you would always try to get in your best work. But the important thing is to just keep out there and keep doing it. Totally. Maybe there's some beauty in not having too much pizzazz. Maybe that's part of what this year is right now, seeing the beauty in a different perspective and figuring out ways to share that. Exactly. I mean, look, at, look at lots of books. You know, look at lots, absolutely. And by the way, photography books. Yeah, we get to take a, a over the shoulder view of you going through the books that have inspired you. Well, listen, guys, thank you so much once again. And we will be definitely checking in with you again and finding out your other challenges that you've had to overcome through this crazy year. But thanks again, you guys. Love having thanks. you with us. Thanks, Jared. And you guys, listen, I'm not kidding. In this course, you get to see all the stuff Bob has been talking about here in tremendous detail, but in real time. In other words, how he actually approaches a real shoot, an assignment. Uh, he had an assignment to shoot for um, uh, a collection in, um, and I'm, uh, the, the name of the book is escaping me. Bob, if you're still there, maybe you can tell me. that. Anyway, the, um, we shot two vineyards or wineries in Napa. You see the beginning, middle, and the end, how he prepared for it, what uh, equipment he used, how he got inspired, everything, and then what we do at the end to wrap it all up. So I don't know who authorized knocking off 300 bucks off this thing, but you guys get it. Uh, take advantage of that because you're not going to see that happen again. You can all right. Me. What you was that? Me. You can owe me the 300. I'll, <laughs> oh, Bob, 300. Every one of you guys that signs up, I'm going to have to give them a check for 300 bucks. What kind of deal is that? <laughs> okay, so... Anyway, listen, we covered a lot of ground today. This is awesome. Always good to have you guys with us. The point of uh, creating a like your own magazine assignment is a really great idea. I want you guys to take that to heart and do that. So listen, we're wrapping up a big week. We did a lot of stuff this week, and um, we're going to kick back here for a couple of days. I think we've covered everything. One or two last things I've got to remind you guys to, if you haven't done it already, subscribe and enable the bell. And, you know, here's the other thing is leave your comments, share the video, like it. You know, I love having you guys part of our community. We're built, we're really building a strong community with the AYP club. And if you're not a member of that, Jared will put the link in there so you guys can join because that's where we carry the discussion on when we're not on video. Well, apart from that, taking the advice of these two amazing people, remember to get out and capture your own images of life. Stay well, you guys. Stay safe. Stay creative. And we'll see you really soon. Love you.